I like this place. I like the um, I like the community feel of this place and the way that it sits within Birmingham suburbs and the mess of the middle of England. And I like the way it feels like a mini train <laughs> station. <laughs> steampunk maybe. <laughs> Bit cool. Okay. So um, I give thanks to the spirits of this place. My best memories of this place are doing ritual outside during network um, AGMs. And there's a sense that one should, as a druid, one should find places of, of serene beauty where one can, without any doubt, worship, celebrate, the beauty of the natural world, and doing it in a muddy little garden, surrounded by tatty pine hedges and a traffic going past really gives me a sense of what druidry should be, which is every moment we breathe, however rough the environment. And the rougher the environment, the more our prayers should be really felt, the more we should thank the gods for what we have. Anyway, verbal. Introductory verbal, I give thanks to the spirits of the place and for all of you who brought us here and who invited me here today. Fish, as is usual for a conference organiser, asks asked me to give names for the talk um, uh, too long ago. And those of you who know me know that I'll write, if I'm giving a talk, I'll write it three or four hours before I give it. Because yesterday, actually, my whole psyche, my whole soul, my whole being was a different person than it is today. So if I wrote it yesterday, I wouldn't be able to like, work out what I was talking about yesterday because I'm clearly going to say something different today. So I have to do it in the moment. Yesterday I did put down a few words and I have no idea what it's all about now. <laughs> but I wanted to start indirectly with sort of a, an oblique tangent to the talk title that I gave to Bish. And that is about why we write books. I'm a compulsive writer. I've always written. Um, when I was young, I wrote more than I spoke. And so I write because I have to write. Writing a book is something different. It's a, a sort of a strangeness of, of writing something and then giving it to other people to read. I wrote Spirits of the Sacred Grove, my first book, um, in the lovely old beautiful picture cover before the Americans got hold of it and put my face on the cover and called it Druid Priestess, much to my embarrassment. But Spirits of the Sacred Grove, which is about to be reprinted in the 15th anniversary edition, which is really nice. Um, I'm going to see if we can get the old picture on it. But I wrote that because I wanted, I was seeking a Druidry which expressed, I was seeking books and teachers of a Druidry that expressed what I felt Druidry was. How wonderfully egocentric that is. <laughs> um, but the Druidry I kept coming across was very male oriented. It felt very abstract. It felt very, um, very thinking, um, conceptual. It really wasn't muddy <coughs> enough. It really wasn't <coughs> earthy enough and, and dirty enough for me. And having explored my own Druidry, I needed to write it down in order to really understand what it was that I was practicing, that I was feeling, that I was starting to believe. It's an important word, believe. Believe is like the beloved, it's what I really, um, I was in love with in terms of my spiritual, my religious practice. What I felt was my beloved, my gods, the land, um, what I was devoted to. But also there's an element of believe which has a, a notion of the, of the conceptual, of, of not quite what I'm touching, a bit of faith there as well. I'm taking a leap into, into something that I understand. And I needed to write it down, to go through the limitations of language in order to understand just what it was that I was doing. So I started writing this one. The other two books I wrote, Principles of Druidry and Ritual, um, I was commissioned to write. I wouldn't have done those if I hadn't been asked. And the same with Living Druidry, which was an extension really of, of Spirits of the Sacred Grove or Druid Priestess. It was a deeper version, really. Um, but again, I was asked to write it. It wasn't my 
incentive, my motivation. The next book I wrote, The Apple and the Thorn, I don't know if I've got the right order here, The Apple and the Thorn, again I was asked to write it by Bill William uh, Melnick, who I wrote the book with. And strangely enough, though, writing The Apple and the Thorn, I think still, for those of you who've read it or haven't, is a, the purest expression of my religious practice, perhaps put into fiction. But um, that allowed me a way of saying exactly what I felt to be my true understanding, my true experience. Not narrated, but narrating the process of it in, in that novel form, um, which, which is interesting. Kissing the Hat was the next book I wrote. It wasn't the next book that was published, but the next book I wrote. And that was the next book that I really wanted to write. I had to write it because I wasn't finding a book that said what I wanted to read, so I had to write it. And in writing Kissing the Hag, I explained to myself through the process why it's so bloody difficult to be a woman, a human being, a female one. But also, in some ways, it said the same thing as my first book, or my first The Druidry books, which is, how am I understanding nature as something that I am devoted to? How do I cope with nature as raw and wild and bloody and muddy? How are my drives of human nature, lust and hunger and frustration and the, 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 the aggression and all of these things which are natural parts of our human nature, how are those a part of my religion? And how do I explore those without suppressing them or putting them to one side or in some way negating or diminish, dismissing my human nature as something that's not sacred because it's not very nice, it's not very easy, it's not very graceful. So in what way can I understand the harsher, harder, muddier, dirtier parts of nature inside me and around me? Nature around me um, uh, was much more in the books on Druidry, Kissing the Hag was very much about how do we cope with being women? Because we're not nice very often. <laughs> Naturally, we are protective and, and um, manipulative and we cope with the swings of our hormones and then we cope with the menopause which makes us grumpy as hell and, and all of these difficulties of being, of being a woman. One of the reasons I had to write, so here I am, exploring nature, and exploring why and how I am devoted to nature as my religious practice. And exploring why it's so difficult to behave well. But not wanting to suppress all of those bad behaviours, and say, no, 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 uh, I'm, I'm nice, really I am, I'm enlightened, you can see it, shining. <laughs> um, and I never get angry or judgmental, not at all. Um, I wanted to explore where my gods were within those difficult parts of nature. In doing that, I wrote the next book, Living with Honour, which is my ethics, the pagan ethics. And you can see, I hope, my burbling, meandering journey of talking here, the journey of my writing. Actually, then I started thinking, okay, so these are my gods in the hardest parts of my nature, in the hardest parts of nature around me. So, what way do my beliefs affect my decisions? And understanding that every decision I make is in fact an ethical decision, a decision of ethics. Every action I take is about my ethics. We are moral creatures in that we make decisions based on our beliefs. So if I declare myself to be pagan and to be a earth oriented, nature-drenched devotee of the gods of nature, a real green, dark, dark green pagan, an animist. What does that mean in terms of my ethics? So Living With Honour was the book that I wrote, which described, I, held, I hoped, not just the basis of my <coughs> beliefs, but the way in which those beliefs played out into decisions. So if we believe that, then surely we should behave like this. Or maybe we don't, in which case are we believing this 
in which case then maybe that is the implied, the, the inevitable, the, the decision we make. Um, so what led me to write The Wakeful World, which is the book um, I've just had published. I start The Wakeful World actually by saying that, you know, the work of a philosopher, I would say a thinking priest as well, a druid maybe, is to tear apart our assumptions. And that's really important. <laughs> Because so much of what we do is based on assumptions. We assume that our boyfriend isn't talking to us because we've done something wrong. Oh, terrible. We assume that we've got away with taking a left hand turn when the big sign in the road says don't uh, the police jump out. We assume that we are too fat, too old, too ugly. We assume that nobody likes us. We assume that someone adores us. We make all kinds of assumptions and so often we're very wrong. We assume much more important beliefs. We assume that maybe the meat that we're eating is ethically produced. We assume that the clothes that we're wearing were made by happy people. We assume that the trees that are being cut down are all going to be replaced. We assume that we're all going to still be here in five years' time. Or a few of us may not be, but we assume that humanity will be, that there won't be a nuclear holocaust. Do we assume that? Most of us do. We assume some kind of immortality on some level of denial. We assume so many things. We assume that the floor underneath us is solid. We assume that there's space in between us. We assume that what we can't see isn't there. The philosopher tears all these apart. And compulsive writer, I'm a compulsive asker, questioner, why? Are you sure? I'm not so sure. Why? That irritating child. <laughs> I've always been. When I got to the beginning of writing Living with Honor, I had a pretty good definition of animism. I could give you a sound bite definition of animism. I had it down onto a postcard. In any, any environment, with any means, I could tell you exactly what animism was. <coughs> I was proud of that. Not my definition, but I was proud of my animism. I thought I understood it. By the time I got to the end of writing Living With Honor, I realized that the book was actually based on an assumption, a whole book. And of course, that assumption was the fundamental premise of the book. I don't negate the value of the book. But it is based on a belief which actually I assumed the reader would agree. If you don't, of course, then you don't agree with the book. But I hadn't deconstructed that assumption. And that assumption is the foundation of animism. Nature has inherent value. Nature is important for itself. It's not just the value, the usefulness that we give it. All of nature has inherent value. Why? I got to the end of Living With Honor and realised I could not define animism. I had no bloody idea how to define animism. Which is gorgeous because I've written the book in order to clarify to myself exactly what I believed in terms of the foundational understanding, the perceptions and the implications of those beliefs. And I got to the end of it and I thought, hang on a minute, it's all based on an essential assumption. Bloody hell, I'm going to have to write another book. <laughs> and I don't know how many writers who are in the audience agree with my experience of writing, but at the end of a book, and for another six months afterwards, I swear I'm never going to write another book. And I realised I'm going to have to write a book, but I'm going to have to write a metaphysics. I'm going to have to actually describe what animism is to explain why 